marketable securities portfolio. This is uh, Pius's uh, portfolio. Uh, in the last uh, six months, it's down 9%. The market is down significantly lower. Welcome, Chege. I've not seen Chege there. Chege, Chege is looking after the, after the bank. So if there's any question on the bank, I think Chege will be able to, to address it. So that's, that's Chege Dumbi. Chege, Chege is the CEO of, of Citibank, Bank, and we're very lucky to have him leading that particular institution. He's doing a wonderful, a wonderful job. And of course, there's Michael Mugasa, who is our auditor. Uh, he's the audit partner from, uh, from PwC. So he's one who looks at the, at the numbers. So the current allocation we have is about 3.6 billion. We, it's, it's, it's lower than where we'd like it to be, but it's just as well because you've seen how the markets have performed. So so I think as you conclude the exits, the intention is to increase this, uh, this, this backup uh, progressively. It is uh, well diversified, and that's why you're able to uh, have a 9.2% decline despite the situation where the market is significantly lower. On a long-term basis, from when we started uh, this particular uh, strategy, we have delivered about three times above the market. So if you look, a thousand shillings invested in the NSC would be uh, 1025 and on our portfolio is about five times. So overall, over the last five years, I've generated an IRR in excess of 20% on our QP portfolio, and obviously it's a major source of liquidity into the business. The development portfolio, uh, I'll start off with education. Uh, this is a school, so we have a company called Ace Holdings. We have a number of other partners in that particular company. The most significant development is that the school we are constructing, we began this a few years ago, along Kiambu Road called Sabis Runda. It opened in uh, September and it admitted its first batch of uh, students. Uh, Masi is here. Masi, uh, put up your hand. Masi, Masi is the CFO of, uh, of ACE. Um, he's one looking after that, that business. So for those of you who have not had a chance to visit, uh, we have an open day on 1st of uh, December. Uh, I know Thomas is looking at me because he had intended it to be for staff and their family, but also I think the family of Centum also extends to the investors of, of Centum. So you're all... Uh, you're all welcome. Uh, Thomas will just have to adjust your budget. Of course, within the cost to income, uh, uh, <laughs> of course, within the cost to income ratio, whoever wants to come uh, for the open day on the 1st of December. So you're all, you're all invited at Thomas's cost. Um, so it's a, it's a wonderful institution, and um, it would be wonderful if you all had a chance to visit it, and it's picking up well. On the power, um, I'll speak briefly about where we are on those. Um, these have obviously taken a lot longer than we had expected they were going to take. Uh, on Akira, we finalized the various uh, steps. Those are all finished, the, the licensing, the PPA, uh, the generation license, th th those are finalized. We did exploration drilling last year. We're just on the tail end of concluding uh, discussions with strategic partners so that we can resume exploration uh, drilling within our concession, concession area. And we expect to conclude that towards the first quarter of next year and then, and then resume, resume the process. Um, the reason it takes time is it's not a straightforward process. You, you're drilling about 3,000 meters and you have to drill several wells. 3,000 meters is three kilometers. So the kind of surface studies you need to do and, and, and more work you need to do is quite, uh, is quite extensive. So the first phase of this project is a 70 megawatt uh, geothermal project. Amu power, um, this has progressed well. Um, we have most, most of the things are in place here. Uh, the PPA, the ERC license, the, um, the, the power generation license, uh, the lot of support is in, uh, is in place. The various challenges we had, those have now been uh, resolved. So, the, so we are progressing on to financial, to financial close on that, on that project. Greenblade Growers is our agricultural project. This is another project we began from, uh, from scratch a few a few years back, I think two years ago. Again, it's progressed, uh, it's progressed well. It's, um, and I think it has a, a lot of potential. So here we are focusing largely on herbs, uh, fresh produce, but the idea was to start off with it as a nucleus and then expand it. So we have an independent board that is sitting here that is looking after this business, and it has significant export potential. Today we're exporting to Europe, we're exporting to parts of, the U of, of Canada, but we see opportunities to export now directly to the US and also to China. So it's a market-led business, and you only expand production capacity as you lock in markets. So we don't grow speculatively, and then we partner with outgrowers 
for those crops that we cannot grow because we are at a high, a high altitude. So it's a business that will continue to expand, particularly as we expand the market opportunities. I think that gives you a sense of where the business is in terms of our four business lines. So I want to invite uh, Sam. I think he'll be presenting, this is the second from last financial presentation. His last p and will be to, to March. So I want to invite him to share with you the financial review, then I'll come back and conclude with the outlook. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Uh, thank you, James. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I think all things held constant. Uh, the next presentation would be a different CFO. But I'll be available. I think my role now will be answering questions on real estate during investor briefing. Yeah. All right. So James has largely covered the key performance drivers, which I will briefly summarize. Uh, he talked to the Gen Africa transaction, from which we've recorded a gain of 1.2 billion shillings. And the one thing to mention about this transaction is what it says about the portfolio valuations. Before, just before the financial year end, we had marked it to the transaction price or transaction valuation because by that time we had already signed the necessary agreements. But immediately before that, the carrying value was 1.4 billion. So comparing the, that preceding value with the realized gains, it's a move from 1.4 billion to the 2.3 billion. And I suppose that speaks uh, to our constant message uh, on the very conservative valuation of our portfolio. On the real estate, uh, again, James has highlighted the transactions have been going on, uh, specifically on the land transactions. The carrying value today, uh, the book carrying value of our properties, uh, we've realized sales at very you know, significant, several multiples of that carrying value, and hence the real unrealized gains of 2.7 billion. Within the private equity portfolio, uh, very strong performance in revenue uh, from Longhorn. Uh, on the banking subsidiary, James has talked to the very improved performance, specifically on the trading, uh, the trading finance business. Balances up uh, 7x. Profitability, rather, the non-funded income from that line, up 68%. So while as at September the entity was still at, at a loss position, that loss has significantly uh, decreased. Uh, the balance sheet is now strong, uh, both from a capitalization perspective and a total asset perspective. And as James mentioned then, uh, it's very well poised uh, to return to profitability from the next financial year. So those are the highlight numbers. A very strong performance on investment income, 84% up to 4.1 billion. Uh, net asset value per share up 0.6% to 73.61. Uh, consolidated profit at the group level, 27.5% up to 2.1 billion. Then at company level, uh, 713, 7x. Uh, well, this was moving from a loss position uh, half year last year to just uh, below a billion this half year. Total assets up 1.3% to 60, 67 billion and a total return of 1.1 billion. Which then leads me to the company total return statement. Uh, at be, being an investment holding company, this is the one statement uh, that we as management and the board look at uh, carefully because it's what speaks to the underlying performance of our uh, portfolio of investments. So when I look at dividend and interest income, uh, period to period, about a billion each, and the key item there is the realized gains on the, on the, on the exit of Gen Africa of 1.2 billion, hence total investment income at company level uh, has doubled from 1.1 to 2.1 billion uh, period to period. At the portfolio cost level, uh, if you track our operating expenses, not only have they been coming down compared to total assets, which is our metric, we, we have a ceiling of 2% of total assets, but the absolute value uh, period to period has consistently been on a downward trend. Uh, this half year, we are 9% uh, below half year uh, last year. On finance cost, again, 6% um, uh, lower uh, period to period. Uh, and this is driven by you know, the absolute value of the long-term uh, borrowings are down from about uh, just, just above 13 billion uh, by last year to 11 billion this half year. So profit before tax, um, about a billion compared to a loss position of 151 million 
last year. Yeah, so that's the trend of the operating cost, as I mentioned. So you can track that. You can see from FY15, the trend has consistently uh, been on a downward trend, not just as a percentage of assets, but in absolute value of operating expenses. So this is the company balance sheet. Uh, we present two balance sheets, the consolidated and the company. From understanding centum perspective, this is the balance sheet one would focus on because it's what shows the, our, our investment portfolio and how that is valued and what the shareholder uh, fancies. So of the, 70, of the 67 billion in total assets, about 65 billion is the investment portfolio and about 1 billion, a closing cash position of 1 billion. So 66 billion of the 67 billion is investments and cash. Of those total investments, about 40 billion is our investment in subsidiaries. Necessarily, those are carried uh, at very conservative value, mostly at NAV, other than the bottlers and Longhorn, which is marked to market. Then the debt investment in subsidiaries uh, carried at cost. Uh, the 14 billion is carried at cost. On the liability side uh, of those borrowings, 11 billion would be the long-term uh, facilities, uh, 3 billion uh, being the fluctuating OD. Then other liabilities, mostly the deferred tax. Uh, that carries that or that arises from the valuation of the assets. So we closed at a shareholder uh, funds level of 49 billion, translating to a NNV per share of 73.61. So that is the statement of cash loss for the half year. Uh, the one number to track there is the cash generated from operating activities. And as you can see, a very uh, a significant performance there, an increase from 973 to about 2.2 billion uh, Kenya shillings at half year, largely because of the Gen Africa transaction. We've spent about 1.3 billion in investment, uh, investment activities, both debt and equity, uh, net repayment in borrowings, about a billion, just less, uh, less, less than a billion, and we closed the half year with a cash position of a billion. So that's a gearing. I talked to the long-term uh, facilities, about 11.3B. But the one metric, again, to look at there is the debt service coverage ratio, which looks at um, how many times the operating cash loss cover your, your, your finance cost. And as you can see uh, from FY15, our debt covenants require a debt service coverage ratio of 1.5x. Uh, we have consistently uh, been above that, and you can see as at half year 19, already we are double um, the minimum required of 3.4, at, at 3.4x. Yeah. We recently concluded a uh, credit rating exercise, our annual credit rating exercise, and the results were equally posit positive with a rating of A for long term and A1 for short term uh, with a positive outlook, outlook. This was carried out by Global Credit uh, Rating Company, GCR, of South Africa. So that slide speaks to the debt maturity profile uh, for the 11 billion in long-term debts. Uh, the bond is due for payment in FY21, uh, just about two years from now. Uh, then the last uh, item of 2.5B in the long-term loans in FY22. I won't talk much about that. James will speak uh, to what the outlook is for the, uh, for the company debt. Uh, so now moving to consolidated financial performance, um, and I suppose this is where the business starts to look uh, a bit complex, but the easy way to understand consolidation is simply a summation um, for the various businesses, both at uh, the P&L level and the balance sheet level. Uh, from a tot what we'd call the revenues at group level, you simply look at the portfolio companies and what it is they sell, uh, both in goods and services. So our revenue would be the beverage business uh, that Joyce uh, leads, the publishing business being Longhorn, uh, our startup in agriculture, then the interest fees and commissions of the banking, facility, uh, the banking subsidiary, and the utility sales. The utility sales are the water and power company at Two Rivers. Uh, so the total consolidated turnover uh, is relatively flat, uh, 1%, uh, at 6.4 billion compared to 6.3 billion last year. Uh, of that, the beverage business is likely uh, above 50% of total group turnover, and the publishing business um, about a third of that, a sixth of that. 
Then we have the investment income, uh, which largely then would be any uh, investment operations, be they dividend income uh, or realized gains from transactions. And at this level, you can see uh, the dividend income. So the dividend income at consolidated level would be those entities that we hold less than um, 20%. That's what we consolidate. Anything above 20% at group level is called an associate, and it's not consolidated. So that dividend income, 67% uh, up. The realized gains on disposal at Gen Africa, you will see a slight difference between what is at consolidated level and it, what, what is at company level. Company level profit is simply the proceeds, less the cost. Consolidated level is, again, the proceeds, but less your cumulative uh, share of profits that one has been consolidating. So it's at 1.1 B. Uh, then the valuation gains of 2.7 billion, uh, that is largely driven by the transactions uh, that we spoke about, uh, validated by the, 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 the residential uh, infield projects that we've been selling, but more importantly, by the two land transactions uh, that James talked to. Those have been closed at several multiples to this carrying value. So total investment income, um, almost doubling from 2.2 to 4 billion. With that context, that is how the consolidated income statement of the group uh, looks like. Uh, notably, at the financial services uh, segment, a decrease uh, in the loss position from 111 to 92. Uh, largely driven by the performance of CDN that I spoke to. But then when you look at the investment operations, that's really where the, the, the needle has moved. Uh, total investment income almost doubling uh, 2.2 to 4 billion. And then we closed with the profitability after tax, 27% up. A bit of analysis then on what makes that trading profit and uh, the operating profit from financial services. That's what is covered on the next slide. Uh, so beverage business, uh, James talked to the reduction in the volumes that first half of the year uh, between April and September. Uh, publishing business, very strong performance by Longhorn and then electricity and water sales. Uh, the utility companies at two rivers uh, doubling to 314 million. On the financial services, the one thing to mention there, again, is uh, the Cedian Bank. I don't want to be by the point. I think James has spoken to it, and I've also spoken to the key performance drivers there. What is of note is that uh, for the first time for this bank, the non-funded income is higher than the net interest income. And it speaks very much to the strategy the bank and Centum have been communicating, that it's focusing on the business uh, looking forward being very much driven by the trading finance uh, business, which should, looking forward, be more than half of the business. So that is uh, tracking quite well. Um, so if you look at the fees, Forex and other income at 514, is higher than the 400 or so million in net, uh, net, net, net interest income. Also notable for the bank, um, at September 2018, it had returned an operating profit, uh, just a profit uh, before any provisions. So it's quite on track. Uh, looking forward to return to profitability. On the asset management business, uh, not surprisingly, one would see that decrease because by half year we had already disposed of Gen Africa. So that's largely the performance of the other uh, smaller subsidiary, uh, Nabo Capital. Uh, then this is the consolidated statement of financial position. We do not focus very much on this, but it's presented because it's a requirement of the international financial reporting standards. This simply sums up all the assets and liabilities of anything where we hold more than 51%. Uh, it doesn't consider our share of that. Uh, so a total consolidated assets at 101 billion, up from 96 billion from uh, last year, uh, last, as, as at that first March 2018. Of the 100 uh, billion, about a third of that is our three investment properties. Within the fixed assets, largely those would be the assets uh, of Almasi, the, prop, uh, the plant and property of Almasi, then the investment portfolio, um, being the associates, then quoted investments, the quoted, the bonds, uh, the fixed income securities. The loans and advances would be CDN's loans and advances, then the cash and cash equivalent again simply sums up 
all the other subsidiaries to close at 101 billion. So I won't focus very much on this. The liabilities, of course, would then be the customer deposits and banking liabilities for Cydian, then the borrowings of all the various um, subsidiaries of the group, not just centums. Of this, uh, majority of this, of the 21 billion, other than our own uh, 13 billion there, they would, be, have, they would have been borrowed uh, on an unrecourse facility to, to Centum. Uh, so that largely is it from our um, uh, performance perspective, uh, going back to where I highlighted. In a snapshot, I think these are the key takeaways. Um, profit up 27%, largely driven by a strong performance in our investment income, which almost doubled to 4.1 billion shillings. Uh, with that, ladies and gentlemen, I will call upon James to speak to the last slide, last slide on the outlook. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sam, for that wonderful pr presentation. So I'll speak briefly about the outlook. Um, we've come to the end, we are coming to the end of our Centum 3.0. In that period, our key objective from an NAV perspective, we think we're going to be close at 70% of target, which is not bad given the difficult operating environment we've had over the last five years. Um, on cost, which was other major target, we had targeted to be at around 2%. We are averaging now 1%. Uh, in our strategy, uh, Center 4.2 strategy, which was approved on Thursday last week, there are several key things that were made which are a bit different from what we're focusing on on Center 3.2, and that's what I want to highlight. The first one is is for the business to be more cash flow generative and therefore to enhance the dividend payout. So we are going to focus keenly on the nature of the returns, not just on the capital gain, but also on the annuity income of the business. And we are setting a dividend policy, which is going to be as a proportion of the cash annuity of the business. We'll be able to share with you the details of what that proportion is going to be, but at least the flow we think we can sustain is the current dividend we are paying but then to progressively increase that. To do so, we need to enhance the net cash flow of the business. It therefore means we need to review the capital structure of the business. And just to give you a background, we've come from a phase where we are looking at growing the business. We are now getting into a phase where we would like to provide a greater return to our shareholders while at the same time growing the business. Now to do so, we, in that growth phase, we did not go to the market to raise any equity capital. In fact, over the last 10 years, we've not raised any equity capital. When I took over the business as CEO in 2008, this business had exactly 10 million shillings of cash and an overdraft of 180 million shillings. All the growth has been funded through internally generated funds. It was therefore necessary for us to use debt to achieve that, that growth. However, our view is that where we are now, we do not see ourselves renewing any of these facilities. In fact, our, our intention is to repay all of them as a whole deal. So it is the outlook for the business that in the next two years, at a group level, the balance sheet of Centum will be debt free. The debt will be taken at the individual project company level, not at the parent company, because we now have assets at the operating company that are mature enough and that are cash flow generative that can be able to take on. I see some of our bankers who are here who have supported us. So we'll continue now working at the operating uh, subsidiaries, not at the group level. So that whatever cash flow is coming at the group level is then available for either reinvestment or be dividend distribution. So we have as an explicit target uh, this strategy period to repay all our debt at the group level. We also have an explicit target to enhance the dividend as a proportion of the cash annuity of the business. And the other change we've made is on our cost ratio. The costs are going to significantly reduce at a group level because they are migrating to the various individual businesses. So real estate, some as he leaves the CFO, is also migrating with his team and his costs. Uh, private equity, Fred has his cost base. So they'll carry them at the individual business lines and pay dividend up to, to send them. So the group costs are then going out to be a proportion, not of assets, but of cash. So that then you're able to see what the bottom line is. Our focus is through these measures, because
because we've achieved significant growth in net asset value per share. Where we've not done as well is the gap between the price and the net asset value per share. Is that by consistently enhancing that dividend payout and by giving investors visibility on where their dividend is coming from, we hope that will help in closing the gap so that because we are working for our investors. So whatever we are doing should be able to translate into value add for investors. The other major changes in the private equity uh, business, up until now, we've been investing exclusively our capital. We've had a great track record over the last 10 years. From an IRR point of view, we are at uh, 30 percent. Uh, compared with PE funds across uh, Sub-Saharan Africa of the same vintage, I think you're in the top 1 percent in terms of a track record. In terms of exits, by the end of the year, we'll probably be one of the top in terms of realizations because we have a lot of PE funds that have IRRs that are based on mark-to-market positions rather than actual actual realizations. I think we have, a, we have a great track record of realizations. What we'd like to do and what Fred and his team will be doing is, uh, and Tom, who is in his team, Tom Kabuga, who is around, is right there. They'll be raising a, a private equity fund, a Centum PE fund too. And the reason for Centum for doing so is not so much because of the management fees, it's because of the diversification benefits. Well, if you're going to make, to invest in entities with an EBITDA greater than a billion shillings, and you assume you're coming in at an enterprise value to EBITDA ratio of anywhere between eight and 10, those are enterprise value tickets on the lower end of between eight billion and 10 billion shillings. If you assume an equity in there of about 60%, you're talking of about equity valuation of anywhere between four to seven million dollars. If you're going to take 50% and above, you're talking of ticket sizes of between three and a half uh, billion shillings to sort of 50, 60 billion shillings. If all you have is about 110 uh, billion shillings or 115 billion shillings, you're going to make about four investments. The challenge with that is that you're not sufficiently diversified because experience is that even when you make very good bets, you're going to have one or two great companies those will give you 40% and above. You will have average performers, and by average here I mean anywhere between 25 and 30, about six, and one will struggle. So if all you have is four and one struggles, you're going to depress the entire uh, return of the portfolio. Therefore, it's necessary for us to broaden what it is we have. And therefore, the purpose of raising that party funds is to give us that diversification benefit from a certain perspective. That is a major, that is a major benefit. From a pipeline perspective, um, I think the environment is, uh, is attractive to be coming in. Valuations have come down. They are not what they were before. Uh, liquidity is also tight. And a number of very good companies may be looking either for exits and some of them are looking for balance sheet restructurings where they're looking at having more equity and less debt. And therefore, I think it's a good time to have liquidity in the market and to go out and, uh, and get opportunities. So that's something we'll be doing. We did it with NABO a few years ago because NABO before was just managing our marketable securities. Today, we are, Centum is one of their smaller clients. So it's something we've done before in a different segment of the business. It's something we'll be doing in the PE business. So we'll have our legacy assets and the PE fund one, which we are the only investor. And then we have our fund two, which will have new assets. And any new investments we make in our legacy assets will all be done in PE fund one. And to manage conflict of interest, we will not exit fund one assets into fund two. We will sell them into the market when, when we come to, to exits. So that's on the private equity side. That's what we are doing. On the development business, which is um, where we are getting into greenfields, we've made a decision to allocate a lot less capital into that area. The, the lesson we've learned from Centum 3.0 is that the development phase is a lot longer than we had expected it was going to be, and there are a lot of challenges, and also scalability is a, is a challenge, particularly if you look at how the economy is now doing. Uh, scaling up something new now is not, is not as easy. So you may not see significantly new development investments coming in, save for what we've already started. Some we may progress, and some we may, and some we may exit. So that's an outlook of where we see this uh, business going in. You, you may see some sizable exits coming through, Part of the use of proceeds will be debt repayment. So we'll be repaying some of the, of the debts uh, immediately. And the balance will be going into the PE portfolio to be our contribution to the new round of, uh, of, of funding that will be, will be coming through. 
So that is the outlook, which I think is what I've explained here. On uh, real estate, I don't think we, we are likely to be putting in more money into real estate because now it's cash flow generated. So actually, uh, some and his team have a dividend target uh, to pay back money to, to the parent company. So they are generating cash. And that's why we thought Sam was the best person to go there. Uh, he's a man who is accustomed to large amounts of money, so I think he can handle, he can handle money well. So that's why Sam is, uh, is there to look after the money. So that's the outlook of the business. Um, I think uh, this 4.0, you'll see a different, a different kind of company. Um, uh, Debt-free, cash flow generative, consistently paying a dividend to, to our shareholders, and then diversified across the private equity business, the real estate business, and uh, a significantly higher location to marketable marketable securities. So that's the outlook, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, we are open for, for questions. I'll take the easy questions, the difficult questions I'll, uh, I'll effectively delegate to my colleagues who are, who, are around, who are around the room. And this is open also to those who are joining us on uh, live streaming, on social media, please uh, feel free to shoot your questions. Thank you very much. Uh, this is Chirag from Kestrel Capital. Uh, thank you for hosting us this morning. I, I just had a question on the, um, on the investment from uh, the, the proceeds that you'll receive from your exits. And in the future, um, if you could speak more on um, where you'll be angling your investments um, in a bit more detail. Because um, over the last two years, we've seen more exits and we want to see where will cash generation be coming from, from future investments? We can take uh, two or three questions. If they are there, then I can pick them up all together. Good morning. Thanks for the question, James. Our question okay. on the second priority on asset redeployment, help us reconcile how uh, going into um, a fund two, which has a J curve, uh, reconciles with businesses that generate cash to take up to the old core. Okay, maybe I can take those, uh, those questions. Um, my question is on the finance costs. Uh, and from the consolidated uh, statement, it rose uh, quite uh, much. From it's at 1.2 from about 5 million. Please uh, expound on that. So finance costs. The consolidated finance costs. Let me pick those two questions. I think question from oh, you want to pick finance cost first. Oh, why don't you take the finance cost one? Okay, uh, thank you for that question. So at company level, it's below uh, by nine percent. At consolidated, this is simply a summation of then the, just the company plus all other subsidiaries, as long as we hold more than fifty one percent. So it is that in some subsidiaries there would have been a higher level of borrowings and then uh, we simply sum them up. In real estate uh, specifically, uh, previously when the assets were being developed, the finance cost qualify as what you call it. And therefore that would have been capitalized as part of the uh, asset. Now, um, for those entities, the assets are no longer under construction, and therefore that is expensed, which also explains why there would have been that jump. Uh, thank you, Sam, for that question. If you look at that chart, uh, that's a company. That's a company P and L, which is just a company borrowings. You will see finance costs have actually come down from 929 to 874. So when you talk of consolidation, including all the subsidiaries, including 
any company that we own greater than 51%, so it's on account of those other companies uh, which have their own distinct operating, operating structures. So let me take Chad's question and um, read this question on, um, because the two questions are, are related. So if you look at um, in the past five years, investments, the ratio of investments to exit, we've actually invested more than we've exited. We started uh, with a balance, with an asset base of uh, Perception that there are more, but actually we've done more, more investments, which is why the balance sheet has has grown. However, those investments have been in diverse sectors. We've made some of the exits we're doing were actually invested in this period in PE. We've made considerable investments in real estate. In fact, our real estate portfolio, both Vipingo and Palmarina, is debt free. Those are all equity funded uh, investments, and we also made investments in the development side of the also made some investments in, uh, in marketable securities. That's what, that's what we've done. So we've made exits because we're not going out to the market to raise capital to fund our internal um, sort of uh, investment structure. So going forward, what will be the exits that you're going to see, where we'll allocate that capital, new capital, we're largely going to be in two, in two, in two asset classes. It's largely going to be in private equity and in marketable securities. Marketable securities is broader than listed equities. It also includes fixed income uh, securities. So it's, it's a broader asset class than just uh, listed, listed equities. Now, to your question around the J-curve of, uh, of private equity, when we look at what, what has worked for us in terms of the companies that we've uh, invested in the private equity space, because a lot of them were done in this period. Uh, if you look at Platcop was done in this period, Gen Africa was done in this period, even the increase in our shares in Almasi was done in this period. We moved from about 29% shareholding to 54% shareholding. They're all done in this period. What is common about them is that when we came in, those companies were already profitable. So we are not looking to invest in loss-making turnaround situations. That these are typically entities that are already, already profitable and have some form of market leadership, one form or another, which is why we are raising a fund, because the amount that we are going to be deploying, the ticket size is going to be larger than a greenfield. So a greenfield is like now starting green blade, as an example from scratch. The challenge with a startup is that you have the opposite. You may not pay as much, but then you have actual, an actual J-curve where in those initial years, you are not breaking even. So you are, you are funding those operating costs from capital. The opposite, when you buy a more established company, you may pay a premium, but then the difference that you're generating profit and dividend from, from day one. So the point here we are making is that we are going to deploy less into development assets and more into cash generative assets. And we want to get that diversification effect by, by pulling, bringing on board other than party funds. And so far we've received good interest for that. But the primary driver is not the, the third party funds. The primary driver is attractive investment opportunities that you can then bring other people to pull in, to pull in capital at. Now, in the interim, as we are doing all that, as Fred is concluding that, that capital is going to be invested with, uh, with buyers in the marketable securities uh, uh, business. So today, even if you put it in at 13%, 14%, you're going to get, you're going to get a yield uh, for, that, for that capital. So that is, the, that is the intention. That is what we are likely to see. The other thing we'll do is that we'll pay down the debt. Today, we are paying about 1.7 billion shillings in annual finance cost, which is actual cash outflow. It is not capital, it's actually cash you're paying. So when you pay down that debt, the actual saving in cash is quite significant. It's about 1.7 billion. So, so that's part of what we intend to do in this, in this period. So then at the net position, you have a significantly uh, uh, better net operating cash flow position. I hope that has answered uh, the, the, the two questions that were, that were raised.
I can't see why the board is not making an investment and buying back the shares. I can't see any business of yours that is generating this kind of IRR. If you've got the share price, which is two and a half times your NAV, buy back your shares. That's the most sensible thing that you can do. That's the best return you can get the quickest. I don't know why the board is not looking at this. Yes, please. Let me please and then the Moi. Moi, yeah. yeah. You are moving. You are now at 45% BOS state and industry, yeah? What is the target in the outlook in terms of those proportions? Good question. Hi, how are you? Uh, my name's Kunal. Uh, based on the results that you announced uh, in the papers, this uh, other comprehensive income, net of tax, this minus 555 million, I, you've not gone into that during the presentation. Can you just explain that? Okay. That is Sam's question. Other comprehensive income. I always, I will, I'm always reminded that uh, actually it's our former director, Jim McPhee, who was our accounting lecturer in financial accounting before. He always kept on reminding me I was never strong in deferred tax. So, <laughs> but that was before other comprehensive income uh, came in. So Sam will pick up that, that question. Uh, so, is another, is another question? Okay. Uh, share buyback. Sunil, I totally agree with you. At this price, the, the price is just too low. And I think you've seen, if you look at the disclosures of insiders buying shares, we are buying more shares. The restriction we have is the insider trading guidelines. We know, we know a lot more about the positive prospects of this company that if we bought shares now, the problem is that we'd have run into issues with the CFO. So the best we can do is disclose what we can and encourage you to buy the shares. Incidentally, I noticed you've sold a bit of your shares, so I want to... <laughs> So that's the best you can do. Um, I think once we've done what we've done, once we've done what we've done, in the market, which is why we've not done a split. On um, the allocation, sorry it's not there, actually we have a strategic asset allocation. The idea is for marketable securities to be at around 20%, that will leave about 80%. Within development will be around 5%, that is 25%, and the balance will be roughly 35-35. Now, this may fluctuate, so from so we, we typically give a bunch, so 30 to 35 for PE, 30 to 35 for real estate, 10 to 20 for, for private, for marketable securities, and between five and 10 for, for development. That's the, the target uh, uh, asset allocation. Now to this other comprehensive income, uh, you didn't address it. No, so I can, I can respond to that. There are two levels of looking at what you call total comprehensive income. Uh, the first one is that the company total return statement, which is the primary statement of focus. And you can see below the profit for the year line, you then have your unrealized gains, the valuation of the portfolio, and then the total return. Uh, at that level, a number, especially for the PE business, a number of the assets will be revalued at the end of the financial year. We don't typically revalue uh, most of the PE assets at half year. So that number will change materially when that valuation of the PE business happens. At the consolidated uh, statement of comprehensive income level, the what you would call other comprehensive income would be movement in reserves of the various subsidiaries, net of deferred tax. And they don't necessarily, actually they do not represent necessarily the revaluation of the portfolio. So this could be the translation reserves, for example, when you're consolidating uh, foreign subsidiaries, uh, deferred tax movement within uh, the equity uh, reserves of the various subsidiaries, that's what returned uh, that negative. You can see, sorry, uh, it's not shown here, but it was 
um, in, the, in, the, in the notes that were testing the paper. If you look period to period or even year on year, that line typically would fluctuate because it's a balance sheet fluctuation of reserves. Yeah, not the, not the valuation of the portfolio. Hey James, thank you to you and your team. Uh, a couple of things. One is, uh, so as far as Centum is concerned, how tapped out is Kenya when we look at regional? Uh, of course, Kenya has been doing much better than our neighbors, uh, you know, at least on the surface. So uh, how are you looking at in terms of expansion? I know there was a deal in Uganda that fell through, um, you know, the purchase of the farm for green blade, I believe, or something of that sort. So uh, what are we looking at ex-Kenya, I guess is my question. Uh, the second thing is, I had, uh, when I was going through last year's uh, um, report, and plus, you know, I was just doing some market research, uh, TRDL borrowed some short-term money at 18 to 19%. Now, uh, you know, uh, our friends at Saiton borrowed that stuff, stuff at 18 to 19, so I was surprised that we do the same. Um, yes, a lot of people draw parallels. I don't believe in those parallels between the two firms, but nevertheless, you know, it does concern me why we're borrowing money uh, at those rates. Um, one other uh, thing, when we're talking about um, uh, translation reserves, that's deferred tax and all that, um, from our uh, associates, you know, those we can, we have some sort of influence over, subsidiaries, associates, do we um, do any of these, shall I say, uh, to be conservative, do we go in and ask them to provision to write off stuff so that, you know, the books coming up from their end are more conservative. That's the term I'd like to use. Brings me to the final thing, valuations. So I was looking at, thank you for the detailed uh, annual reports. So I was going through the, uh, the valuations and for example, I saw Sidian was valued at, you know, 1.16 plus a 20% premium and that's a bank. And if I go out into the market today, and I'm just talking biases, if you ask bias and look at marketable securities, very few banks are trading, maybe equity, I think, but very few banks are trading at those sort of PEs. So, you know, why would Sidian, just as an example, be valued more than any of the other banks that we have out there? Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Rakesh, for this. Uh a better economy do the investing in Africa. And we actually struggled to find a better investment destination than South Africa. So I think because we are focused on the region, Kenya remains very much a key area of focus. And what we tend to do is to support our businesses to expand to those areas. So a lot of businesses then want to expand to those areas because the challenge is that Kenya is still a relatively much larger economy than the other economies. So when you're talking of Larger entities, they are likely to gather near the entities and to expand, to expand as well. So Kenya is going to remain relatively important, and frankly, my outlook for Kenya, despite everything that people say, I think is is, is positive. I'm yet to find a better investment destination in this region better than this country. On uh, on TRDL, uh, so TRDL, several things. Um, let me speak about our real estate generally. So we have three real estate portfolio companies. One is Single Development, which we own 100%, that is debt free. Uh, Palmarina, which we own 100%, that is debt free. TRDL, we own 58%, we have other shareholders. So we are not in total control of the capital structure of that, of that company, we have other parties who have invested there. So what happened to TRDL is that they had a facility with a bank where they ended up having borrowed but also having had cash in that bank, actually the deposit was higher than the amount they had drawn down at the time when that bank went down. And at that time, their title was stuck there. So, so they were then in a situation where they had borrowed only $5 million and they had a deposit of $6 million and they had their security stuff, they were trying to get it and they needed access to liquidity. So, so, t so, that's, so what we tend to do for those non wholly owned subsidiaries they adopt their own short-term financing uh, mechanisms because that's not, 
they are independent of, 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 the parent, of the parent company. And I think now they have finally sorted out that, that, that issue. Uh, KPL has finally sorted out that issue. So that's the situation with, uh, with, with, with TRDL. On the valuations, if you look at our private equity company valuations, I think the proof of the pudding is the exits. If you look at the exit valuations relative to the current valuation, we've had about uh, eight exits in the last five years. And I think each one of them has been significantly higher than the current value. Is that, is that correct? Each one of them. Each one of them, and I can take them in order. If I look at uh, Gen Africa, we exited at 2.2 billion. 2.3, we are carrying it at 1.4. Uh, Platcop, we exited at 2.6, we are carrying at 1.8. Uh, prior to that, we exited Qual at 1.1, we are carrying it at 7, 700. Prior to that, so I can go on the list, yeah? So they are all significantly uh, higher, and that's, so we try to be very conservative in our private equity valuations. If I take the same example even on our land carrying values today, I take an example of where we've had a recent transaction like Kitingo, the multiple of the transaction is many, many times what we are carrying it at. So we try to be careful to ensure that we don't end up with a value that is higher than what we can, what we can, what we can realize. So that's the, um, I think that, that addresses the question on the whole for, on, uh, on valuations. And um, Rakesh, you wait and see the, the exits we're doing. Let's see how they'll compare to, to, carrying, to carrying value. You may, you, you may conclude. Uh, let's, see, let's see where we, where we end up uh, when we're done. Uh, have, I, have I addressed the three questions? Have I missed any questions? So for the subsidiaries, um, for the subsidiaries, we have uh, monthly business review meetings. I think those who sit in our subsidiaries, Ambua, can you confirm whether it's true or not? <laughs> At least, <laughs> so we meet every month uh, for the subsidiaries. For the associates, now we have fewer associates because remember we changed our strategy to move away from associates to more to more subsidiaries. So it's, it's straightforward. Each one of them has a strategy, each one of them has a budget, and every month we review. And the thing we are able to do is quick decisions. We're able to make very fast decisions in all our various subsidiaries in the monthly business review uh, meetings, uh, many of which I, ch I, I chair. So every month we have at least, uh, how many meetings do we have? 20? Yeah. So we go through every company and we're able to see on a real-time basis where each of these businesses, um, each of these businesses is. Because that's when you can drive these numbers. It's those have to deliver on their, on their growth. And if there's any decision that needs to be made, you, you don't have to wait uh, for the meeting. You can be able to make those decisions quite quite early on. Yeah. Any other question, Rakesh? Uh, yeah, there's one question on social media from John. Uh, he'd like to know, what are Centum Investment missed opportunities in 3.0 strategy period, and what are the lessons learned? We had a long slide on lessons learned in our strategy review. I think one of the big lessons learned was on um, was on the issue of the development assets. These are the greenfield opportunities. Just a sheer amount of time, effort, and sometimes it does not translate into into returns. I think for us that was a huge uh, that was a huge lesson lesson learned. I think the other lesson learned, even for those, is the the usefulness of having co-investors because then you're able to share to share the risks with. Uh, with others, so those are some of the lessons uh, learned. Uh, missed opportunities, I think we are quite acquisitive, so I wonder what we missed out. Uh, I'm not sure what we missed out, but what came to us, I think we picked up a good number of them. Um, so I don't think we had that many missed opportunities yeah, in, the, in the last uh, three to two period. So we are available. Uh, after this to respond to any questions and we now have an investor relations team. We've met George, we've met uh, Suzanne who's there. So Suzanne heads, heads that team. 
I and my colleagues are available. I wish to thank you for your kind attention. I wish to thank my colleagues, both at Centrum and our subsidiary and all our partners, our financing partners who we work with and who make this uh, possible, our various investors, for your support. And we look forward to continue to carry on with this journey because it's not really just about talent, it's about developing our, our country. And, uh, and we're very excited about the prospects. Of course, there are going to be challenges. And if there are no challenges, it will not have been necessary for us to be to be here. Our role is to to perform despite the, to continue to perform despite the challenges. Thank you very much. Uh, we feel a lot of breakfast and we are all available to address any further questions you may have. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, I think this is time to bid farewell to Sam as CFO. We won't be seeing him here again. Uh, I'd like to say a big thank you to our board representative present, Dr. Moses Ikeara, shareholders present, uh, members of the management team of Centum Group, uh, your, our guests today, the investor community, as well as those joining us through the social media. Thank you for joining us. Please feel free to share any questions that you may still have. We will try and address them in the course of the day. And one thing I think, uh, we forgot to mention is there's also a call after. So for anyone who would like to an invite, you can reach out to investor relations at centum.co.ke for any inquiries. Uh, thank you very much and have a lovely day.